Hello, Eric. Welcome to Hello. your podcast. <laughs> it's, it's great to be here. I was invited on by Malcolm, who said, hey, I've got this friend who's doing this cool thing with a podcast. You should do it. And I was like, sure, Malcolm. Why not? So my understanding is that this is your podcast where you are interviewed by other people um, for some growth edge kind of reasons that I'd love to dig into. Um, but since you know this better than I do, can you explain for any one who's for whom this is the first podcast of yours, what's going on here? What are we doing? Right. So the initial idea is uh, that I have trouble taking my own first person perspective. Normally, I'm the one asking people questions. And so if a lot of people are going to be asking me questions, uh, that would be that's, and I would have to answer them from my perspective. Uh, that's, you know, that's part of my growth edge. Um, there's also a way where I tend to reflect whoever is interviewing in certain ways such that like, I don't know, I can say different things every time. And it's not just, you know, I'm saying the same things over and over again, except for maybe this preamble a little bit. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And out of interest, I think this is like the fourth one now, if I, if I was counting That's correctly right. on YouTube. So, um, what's come up so far? Like, I think clearly the first one has its own particular vibe about it being the first one. This is now the fourth one. How does this one feel different compared to that one? Doing the fourth one. Well, yeah, do it. the first one, it was like, oh, we're, we're doing a thing. It's maybe, maybe it's going to work. Oh, this is pretty fun, actually. Um, and now that we're on the fourth one, it's like, oh, I guess the ball's rolling on this one. Uh, so far, most of the guests have been introduced in a chain. So uh, Tashin was like, Sylvia should be on this podcast. Sylvia was like, Nat should be on this podcast. And then you're sort of a, a fresh chain. So mm. we'll get to see who you think should come on this podcast next as well. Oh, cool. So I get to, to pass the bat on, as it were. That's right. That's exciting. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways we can go. I think it's interesting as a frame because we haven't spoken before. I think we had a, a two minute kind of wave at each other on a Zoom call when Malcolm was around and that's it. Um, yep. So I guess I'm kind of seeing this as like us talking to each other, having an intro conversation that just happens to be recorded and where I'm kind of asking questions more than I otherwise would be kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, is, is more that than you otherwise kind would of thing you're... Oh, well, like if we were having a one-on-one -on -one chat, for example, um, and it wasn't in the podcast frame, I think I would feel we could kind of go back and forth more as like a kind of general conversation. Whereas this mm. frame, I feel like you are the star and I will be in kind of question mode or like, hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more mode, more than I otherwise would be. Um, mm -hmm. Now I just want to check, is that what you're looking for? Or would you rather have more of a kind of back and forth? I, I like the question. Um, okay. Yeah, no one has a, I asked, quite asked that question, or at least they haven't asked it that way yet. Um, I think if we incline towards the frame of I, I am being asked questions, it might, you know, sort of balance out things because I have a tendency to, as I said earlier, also ask people questions and uh, it's then the other person talking most of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Great. So, yeah, I guess since... Since this is our first time having a conversation, I'm I want to kind of get to know you a bit as a as a person. Um, so just really directly, how are you today? What's what's a life for you in this moment? Well, uh, you know, we're speaking across time zones. I just got up and it's in your evening. Um, how am I in this moment? Uh, I have a little bit of something like nervous anxiety getting things ready for the podcast and then being like okay ooh, on the podcast now <sighs> um and still settling in a little bit mm. there's something interesting I'm, I'm noticing that i saw you doing in the in our pre-conversation before we started this which is like kind of thinking with your body so you were kind of asking yourself oh there's something here but i can't quite f and you were you were gesturing and you were it, it's i get the sense that you're asking your body something or you were thinking through your body can you just say is am i right in that interpretation or what's going on there yeah that sounds right um 
feel like I'm often asking my body something and then I'm trying to like translate that into words a lot of the time. Uh, so that I have like a, you know, a verbal loop running and then that's doing its thing. And then separately from that, I have to be like, okay, verbal loop, like what's just, what's, what's, what's going on? Where, what needs attention? Um, and then there's, there's something in between sometimes as well, where it's, you know, thing, thing, thoughts that I have feel like they're located a bit in my um, proprioceptive space. Like I, I have a thought over here a little bit um, that like has been like poking me. Um, that was kind of what I was noticing. That's fascinating. I mean, kind of diving straight in the deep end a little bit, but um, this mm -hmm. is a, a theory or an effect I've been noticing as well with the kind of, it feels like thought forms are mapped onto space in some sense, and you can interact with them as though they were in space. So hearing someone else articulate that back is is very interesting. Have you always had this sense or has it been cultivated or something in between? I would say something in between. Um, it's been like this for you know, such a long time that I, you could say it's always been like this, but at the same time, I uh, have been being more aware of you know, embodiment practices. And, you know, part of what I was thinking uh, going in here is like, oh, I, I get, to, I've been talking a big game when it comes to embodiment of some kind, I guess I'm <laughs> going to get, you know, checked by this Michael Ashcroft guy, maybe. That's one thing that's well, been in the background for me. That's interesting. I mean, I, hmm. It's funny because my, I think my reputation is not necessarily helpful in that regard that I don't teach my thing as an embodiment thing, um, although mm. clearly is that as well. Um, I engage with it much more as an awareness-based thing that happens to include the body um, rather than getting people into their bodies, so to say. Um, so, I mean, what's your, I'm curious about this whole embodiment thing because it's not a term that I use very much. So to you, what is embodiment? What does that mean to you? Hmm. Surprising, surprising answer and question combo there. Uh, we can dig sense, into that. Though. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess when I say embodiment, there is an ele an element of body awareness is mm -hmm. as a like thing that I'm really talking about. Um, are you like in order to yeah like be embodied or notice anything happen in the body, you have to be aware first. Um, so maybe that's actually what I mean. And you have just helped me articulate this thing better. Okay, cool. So what was the, what was the transformation there? So something's just articulated better. What was the old version before you got there out of interest? Uh, it was a very good question. It's, it's like, a. it was more of a vague hand wavy sense of when I say embodiment, I'm just like embodiment. Good. The thing, uh, ah, um, but you know, if I look at it and from a more technical, technical perspective, there's like there are people who are embodied, but they're not able to interface with it or talk about it or uh, uh, introspect about their phenomenology, and that is like. A huge part of what I care about uh, mm. when it comes to embodiment. Um, I, it's what I care about when it comes to many things. I just think, you know, embodiment is, you know, one big part of it. Um, another big thing that I would like people to be aware of is like, what kind of social strategy do they seem to be running as a like totally different thing? Interesting. I mean, what connects those two things? Because they clearly came together in your mind just there. <laughs> uh, j just the awareness bit. Like, there's a, am I aware of how I'm feeling in my body? What does this mean about the current situation and how I'm doing and relating to it? Um, but then there's sort of a looking at what I appear to have been doing and what goals I seem to have that is a <clears throat> social strategy introspection thing um that one has like an inside and an outside view as well 
uh, in a different way than the embodiment one is just like very inside view. But it's the thing that links them together is the awareness bit or the ability to look hmm. at what, what is happening. Can you say more about that inside and outside bit? I'm curious about the distinction that you draw between those two. So inside view and outside view is a thing that yes. I'm taking from, uh, it's been popular in the EA movement, the effective altruism movement. Um, and I think it comes from rationality uh, and uh, Schelling, Thomas Schelling. I'm, I'm not sure about that part. Um, but the inside view is like, you know, what, what is happening in this particular situation according for, to my point of view uh, so the inside view of the situation, um, and what are all the particulars that are unique? Um, the outside view is like, how has this kind of situation gone in the past? Uh, what are the things we can predict about it? So like, I don't know, outside view says this podcast will be a, somewhere between uh, an hour and a half and two hours just based on all the previous ones. Um, inside view says, well, it doesn't say anything in particular about how long this might be yet. Uh, hmm. uh, we haven't talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so applied to a social situation, uh, an inside view is like, you know, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's like what you think you're doing from the inside uh, when you're, I don't know, what am I trying to do with this podcast? You know, how successful is this podcast going to be? Uh, how many episodes are there going to be? And I'm like, well, I've got, you know, more lined up and da, 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 da. Um, and in like an outside view might say, well, most people don't get past, uh, I think it's most of them don't get past three episodes. Many of them do not get to 20 or so episodes uh, from that, like less than 1% get to 20 or 21 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Out of interest, if you were to ask your body, what would it be like if you didn't get to 10? What does your body say? It's not very happy, but it's like, maybe, maybe we did the thing. A little like... Mm. I'm curious about the phenomenology of that. So how, how did you know that's what it was saying? There's like a, a sinking sensation followed by a like unsinking. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like that. that would be not the goal. That would, that would, uh, huh? That was kind of the, yeah. Interesting. That's kind of work of translation there. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder, just as a game, what other interpretation might there have been of that? Uh, I feel like I can't come up with anything different or original. It's like, that would not be fine. Maybe it would be fine, actually. Um, I, I, in, in particular, this one is like a... There's, there's a move I do make here somehow at some point place in the body mind where mm. bad thing maybe good though i mean it goes mm. the other way too good thing maybe bad um it's sort of like an instant like what if a different point of view mm. uh thing going on that's really interesting it sounds like you're you're able to not get stuck on the the first felt sense response almost mm -hmm. so the idea oh, this is bad there's still a space for something else to arise, which you can kind of explore. Uh, and it does come up in response to the first bit. Um, yeah. Uh, how often have you used the term body-mind? I'm curious. Oh, uh, a lot. Um, okay. So in, in the Alexander Technique, the term is psychophysical unity, um, which translates directly i think to body mind in other traditions i just generally avoid um 
terms that could mean multiple things. I prefer the original jargon of, of my discipline rather than things that have been used a lot elsewhere. I might mean different things to different people, but same thing, I think, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Why did you ask that question out of interest? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a noticing that like oh, I'm using some kind of terminology and I haven't seen you use it or said something in particular that would make me think that you knew it. So I was like, what, what, when I say that, what does it mean hmm. to, to this guy on the other end of this? Um, well, I guess for avoidance of doubt, for me, it means there's, there's no separation. There's one system. Um, mm-hmm. Every thought has a, a body component. Every movement has a mental component. They're all the same thing, ultimately. But that's, I'm curious that you, you picked up on the fact that this might not be a well-understood thing for most people. So... I, I know what you're saying around the felt sense and these movements. I, I, I get that, but I get the sense that you might talk to many people who don't get that. So I guess I'm curious about what your experience has been like in being this way or having this capacity, perhaps with people who might lack this or don't have quite as developed a sense as you do. Mm-hmm. I think even among people who do seem to know a lot, uh, they also like, don't know everything. They don't know, um, they don't know in just my particular niche Mm -hmm. thing. I I, I don't know how niche body mind is. That's another thing is I've been in a lot of niches where there's very specific terminology to that niche, to that subculture. Um, and I, I don't know how far reaching it is. Like sometimes it's terminology that's borrowed, you know, from some paper somewhere that like a lot of other people have read and, but I never, I didn't get that, get it that way. I got it through my social group hmm. and they use it, but then I don't see anyone else use it. So I'm like, hmm. where does body mind come from? I don't actually know. I've just seen Mark use it a bunch pretty much. And then and anyone who's talked to Mark, uh, has used it. Yeah. I think Mark is, um, one of the meditation, um, teachers, experts who I, I respect more because he talks about how physical it is. I think and Tashin mentioned in one of your uh, the first podcast of meditation is a physical thing, um, mm-hmm. which I I loved. I'm I'm very happy to hear this um, this mindset percolate around the in group, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to come back to this in a minute, but there's something else that came to mind just since we I said the word in group is uh, how is your how is your Twitter experience going? Oh yeah. Um, well, I've gotten to almost 60 out of a hundred tweets. I, cool. I've decided to broadcast uh, a bit more my learning process there. Um, it's, it hasn't yet totally rolled, uh, into something that's like, ah, Twitter is like this great thing. Um, it's, it still seems to be in this incubation stage of some kind where, uh, it, where it has, doesn't have quite have that momentum, but it feels like an available thing. Like I actually look mm-hmm. at Twitter more often and I actually reply to people. I have switched up also my Twitter game that I'm playing uh, to like mostly not include replies as like tweets. Mm-hmm. Uh, some, the, it would be over too fast a little bit if I did that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I might hunt- retweet one of my replies. Uh, or like if it's a really good reply and it's like a whole thing, then then I decide to count that. Uh, I've been very recently just kind of not paying much attention to it, though. Hmm. Uh, you said something interesting. You said the word incubating. Um, now, that in my mind, that um, creates an image of like a, an egg and a chicken that will be hatched at some point. Now, I know it's difficult to get a sense of what the chicken will be, but what what is it that's being incubated here, do you think? So like, where do I think this might go that it hasn't yet? Um, Basically it, does it feel like I'm part of a conversation is the Mm. question I'm sort of asking. I don't yet feel like I'm really part of the conversation. Like anybody really knows who I am in some sense. Like, you know, when can I be a, that a certain type of guy to people? Uh, I, I don't get the sense that I'm I'm a type of guy yet to anybody. Um, I have also famously avoided being a type of guy a little bit. 
Uh, so there's the balancing act. Um, yeah, being part of the conversation in a, in a way that's not just, you know, uh, Michael or uh, Malcolm, I'm going to get your names confused now, apparently. Too many M's. Um, yeah. Uh, in a way that's not just like Malcolm referenced me, referencing me a bunch, which is part of the stage we're at, which is very helpful and nice, but uh, so far hasn't been a lot of other people. Tashin has also been like, hey, this guy a fair bit as well. Um, but it's it's not yet like, yeah, it's not yet a conversation. Hmm. I'm, I'm curious about the um, being that guy element of that. So you said that you've historically held back from being that guy and now you want to be a that guy. It sounds like there's some kind of shift happening there. I'm really curious as to what's behind it. I mean, one lens on it is, am I a type of guy who like cannot easily be typified as a type of guy? I mean, mm -hmm. very classic. This would be a very classic Eric sort of move, but it's like, you know, still a type of guy. Um, that's a very, like, you need a lot of data to figure out that someone might be that type of guy, though. And so I'm not at that stage yet on Twitter, for instance. I, I, I'm at that stage with certain friends in real life. Um, but it's also been part of an identity thing where, and, you know, as I said earlier, I tend to reflect in a certain way, whoever's on podcast whoever i'm talking to much more than i am like you know here's my frame and you know my ideas that i'm going to out into the world like uh visa seems to do this uh, malcolm does this um i don't have such a thing that i like project out into the world other than this like well i seem to be hard to get to know or hard to pin down so um, Mm, it sounds like illegibility almost. Yeah. Um, that. So I guess okay. I, I I get this sense just from talking to you that you want to be more visible, but also more legible. And I guess I'm just curious what you think that being more legible would do for you. Sure, I want to be more legible, or I want to be more visible. Well, I like didn't quite catch. Yeah, I mean the. Pick one and then go the other one. I, so I definitely want to be like more you're... visible in a certain mm -hmm. way. If I can be like, you know, visibly illegible in a certain way, that's like, oh, well, it's the illegible guy, you know. Um, whereas if I'm just just illegible and not, if I'm just legible and not visible, that's just, I don't know, everybody. It feels like everyone's like, oh, okay, here's your slot. Great. Mm -hmm. um, and, okay. you know, it's also a dance because it's like legible to who? I want to be legible to the cool people and not to the not cool people. Yeah, it sounds like we're coming back to that um, the the outside view social navigation point that you're talking about earlier. Um, that there's a a group of people out there who seem cool and talk to each other, and know each other quite well, or for internet um, people, they know each other quite well. Um, how to then traverse that scene, that that social graph? As, as Visa puts it, sounds like it's something that appeals to you um, as just a fun game to play. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I've been part of those games before and I've just, I'm not yet part of this Twitter one in particular. Like I, I've been on Facebook and have had a, a lot of friends that I've met in person and that has been, you know, I've been part of groups there. Uh, just Facebook and the people on it that have stayed there are not quite my scene as much anymore. Hmm. Hmm. So I'm curious, just going a bit meta again. Um, mm -hmm. You said Great. you said looping is fun. You said that the people you talk to on the podcast bring out a different element of you. Um, mm -hmm. And we've now been going for <laughs> 25 minutes. And I'm curious what version of you is coming up so far in this call? Uh, I'm noticing more, I have to be more precise with you um, and that I have been more paying attention to what's happening in my body uh, this time. Like I, I earlier noticed I, uh, you, you said something I didn't quite get and I immediately like 
tilted my head a bit and I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's one way curiosity comes up or something where I'm like, wait, what? And I, there's a certain, uh, unconsciousness that happens with that, but I don't always, you know, express it. Uh, so there is, you know, some kind of computation is happening here where like, it is good for me to display body language here in a way that I don't think Michael will think is weird. I don't um, think it's weird. Um, there's an interesting <laughs> point there around um, if you're able to stop or prevent yourself from doing social signaling, should you still do that? Probably not because there's social value in doing the inquisitive look or the confused look or whatever look you happen to be doing. Um, but it sounds like you're doing it very you're aware of yourself while you're doing it, which is, I think, a fairly unusual place for people to be in. Today, in this case, talking to you, I am. <laughs> okay. I'm curious, kind of, I, I'm, I'm enjoying the, the embodiment um, thread. I want to pull on that a bit more. Um, how, how do you practice or how do you deepen your embodiment um, frame, shall we say? Hmm. There's this idea called uh, deliberate performance. Uh, does that mean anything to you? Oh, is that the 10,000 hours thing? That's deliberate practice, isn't it? That's something else. That's deliberate practice, right. So that's yeah. part of the root of deliberate performance. Um, okay. It's, it's an approach that's like um, if, if you have to do your job of some kind um, and you don't have a separate time to like just spend time getting better at your job, you have to be like, doing it all the time. So like, I don't know, you're a teacher in class or something. Most teachers don't, uh, as far as I know, spend extra time like practicing lectures or something. Um, you know, whereas if you're a person giving presentations, uh, sometimes you might do that depending on how comfortable you feel presenting. Um, in dance, I haven't actually spent a ton of time practicing uh, you know, moves or particular techniques, uh, outside of social dancing. I have spent a lot of my social dance time with some amount of in the background, like always working on something, always, uh, having some approach to what I'm doing, uh, or like noticing, uh, something going on in my dance. And I have, you know, filmed my social dancing a lot. So I have turned my like every day, uh, turned my everyday into practice. And I think this is, there's a similar thing with embodiment here and that it's like, how can I have a, like an eye towards embodiment in my everyday life is one question I have sort of asked. Um, and I don't really spend a lot of time separately other than like, if I'm trying to do some therapy modality or, um, like that would, that's like much more, uh, focused and particular on, uh, needing some kind of embodiment practice. I think this mostly comes from focusing in that, like, hmm. uh, what's his, what's his name? The guy who did focusing. Uh, Jenlin. Yes. Jenlin. Um, he was like, it seems like the people who are successful in therapy are asking this particular question and it's not just a mental thing. And, uh, you know, so I was like, hmm. um, so I, I like, you know, took that piece of advice really seriously. And whenever I do any sort of therapy modality, I am often asking, you know, some kind of embodied question to myself to see how I really feel, because that would be the only real feeling. Um, and, I, you know, I do it when thinking as well. And if I'm just trying to solve something, I'm... I'm I'm not as much in the, the astral world, the like very technically detailed sort of programming mindset uh, quite as much. I, you know, step between them, if that makes sense. Can you say more about that world? I'm not following exactly what you mean by that technical or mm -hmm. astral world. And also astral and technical feel like very different things. I'm curious what's, what's in there. Yeah, astral is a term from mage the ascension i believe um and it it, it it's uh mage, mage is a role-playing game that has interestingly divided up um 
phenomenology in a certain way, I think. You can use a lot of it as a metaphor. Uh, astral is like, you know, programming is astral. Uh, legal terminology and legalese and like the very specific meaning of everything is sort of like an astral thing. And a very different thing would be umbral, which is um, the like, like the meaning of, uh, you know, the, the, the father son relationship or something like what is, mm -hmm. what's the meaning behind that versus like, you know, ah, yes, this person is my son, like technical. Versus, like, <laughs> this is our right. relationship. And it has all these like, whoa, feelings going on and uh, all that. So that's what astral refers to. Um, hmm. What was your other part of your question? I missed it. Well, for now, that was that was the question. But I guess going back to your comment earlier is that you said you spend more time, I guess, in the umbral um, rather than the astral. Um, right. So at least I'm noticing. Embodiment. Yes. I'm, I'm noticing in this conversation, I'm like, oh, I can like turn on a bit more of the astral sense of things. Uh, if I'm being you know, technical, I have to actually relate these words in a way that has a you know, more specific meaning than just sort of taking a giant paintbrush and just uh, with like words. So when I'm just like embodiment, ah, oh, good. Embodiment is very good. Uh, and then you're like, cool. What do you mean about embodiment? I'm like, okay, well, I do mean something. I'm not just some like, you know, crazy artist. Um, I can get out, you know, my, my fine, fine paintbrushes as well. Hmm. No, and, I love it. Um, yeah, but I do really like taking the big brushes and just being like word. Uh, it's fun. Yeah, and I wouldn't want to um, to box you into the astral only. If you'd rather be in the umbral, I'm. I guess it's just my curiosity of mm -hmm. there's something here that I'm curious about. I want to dig into, um, and I guess that lends itself more to the astral than to the umbral. Well, and I feel more safe doing that with someone, if I have a sense of someone, you know, being familiar with embodiment and awareness and whatnot, uh, that I can bring in the technical as well. Um, te the technical is where I came from in some sense. I have very much been an internet based person, uh, especially around, you know, 2010 or so. And then I sort of went more into this umbral space and then I feel like the last few years have been like trying to get it reacquainted with the internet because I've had to be on it because of, you know, coronavirus. Mm. There's a sense I'm getting around. Um, if I, an, an analogy I quite like is I don't know if you know the, um, the Enso, the Zen circle that's painted in one um, big motion. Um, I read somewhere and I hadn't, cannot find the reference again, but the, the first half of the movement of the circle, the first semicircle, represents going off to the mountain, if you like, going off, out, leaving the village and going to find the mystery. This is the, and the second half... Uh, adventure, not the adventurer, the hero's journey. Exactly. The hero's journey, yeah, I think it's similar to that. So yeah, you go off to the mountain and then you come back to the village, um, contained in mm -hmm. one, um, one image almost. And it sounds like what you're doing is that you started in very um, astral land, you've gone off to the umbral and now you kind of, how do I integrate these two things? What, mm -hmm. What's that, the, the collision of these two things? Mm -hmm. It's a very good place to be. <laughs> Here we are, I think, doing it live. Nice. So I guess what's your experience of coming back down off the mountain, if you like, or finding ways to make these two things exist in the same place? Uh find you a community that can do both something like this. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems like, you know, Twitter is one community that's better at this, um, post rats being part of that. Um, people who have been maybe taking a similar journey to me in particular, uh, on that lens. Um, it seems like there's other people who've had slightly different journeys to this, you know, in group Twitter sort of thing. Uh, what, what has your journey been speaking of how I came to the Twitter? Uh, how you um, came to Twitter or what, what, where are you on your path? What does your path look like in terms of technical and umbral? If you want to divide up things that way, maybe you, there's a better way to divide it up for you. No, I, I, I'm going to use that. And also the hemisphere model that Malcolm mm. and I are currently diving into. Malcolm talks about a lot. Um, he does. So I would say yes, ast astral first for me. 
um, with a hint of Umbral. I was I was kind of reading magic books as a teen, um, while also reading about um, astrophysics and cosmology. Um, and then I went off and did ten years of very astral, um, thinky technical work um, in the energy system uh, space. Um, so I'm currently on my own umbral journey, but in the hemisphere model, I was very left hemisphere, um, dominant. Um, so very much, um, not getting the big picture, shall we say. And I think that my Alexander technique work rekindled the umbral from my youth and helped me shift into right hemisphere. And now my work is again, integrating the two. So that's why I was curious about your own journey, which sounds hmm. reflective of mine, at least if not the same. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I'm aware that we're kind of just going meta again. When you ask me a question in normal conversation, you'd want to kind of pause and let the other person follow up. But then I'm asking you the question. So should I, should I fill the silence? <laughs> so how does, how does that game work? How do we navigate silence? <laughs> well, one way you can navigate silence is, you know, by asking the, the very question you did of being like, well, hold on a second. There's this silence thing happening, and there's pause between questions, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Here we are. Now I'm saying what I'm saying. What's that it's like funny, for you? I, <laughs> it's funny. I actually like silence. I'm perfectly okay with it, and I wasn't trying to fill it. I was just aware of the the expectation, the ambiguous expectation or ambiguous roles and um, all of that stuff going on, which I guess is a result of this entire thing you've created of the inverse reverse mm -hmm. podcast thing um just made me laugh um so i want to come back to find a community i haven't heard the our, our twitter space quite described like that before where people mm. are, are integrating astra and umbral in that way i love it um, but i haven't come across that before so maybe how if you kind of link that back to your incubating chicken for the thing that you want to get is that part of what this is finding a community finding a community that will help you on your own journey of integrating these different aspects of your your journey yourself that's definitely part of it um uh I, what i notice in your question is this like community oh, that's a that's a different word i haven't heard that word or thought about that word that way uh community is very big in my life it has determined uh, or been a big influence upon how i live my life um what i'm able to like pull on uh you know what connections am i able to make um i during the pandemic and even just before it i feel like i sort of had lost uh much of the communities I have had or like lost reason to be in touch with as much of them. And in part because of what I said before of them being, you know, tending towards just umbral or just uh, astral kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, this community does seem like it, it has a lot of both going on. Uh, although at the same time, Twitter itself is like very astral. Um, so that's that's one sort of tension I'm navigating in the whole thing. Uh, I feel like, you know, and part of how I'm navigating it is having this podcast and mostly posting it to Twitter. Like, you know, if you go to the YouTube channel, it's in the bot in the description. It's like, here's my Twitter. Here's the other person's Twitter. It's like this is a Twitter centric experience. The people I'm talking to are on Twitter. Um, There's something interesting there because I understand how engaging with text on an asynchronous interface can feel very astral. It's very kind of disembodied. But even now we're talking to each other via bits across the internet and I'm seeing a small screen of you and you know, vice versa. Like, To what extent is this really much more umbral than Twitter? I mean, you absolutely cannot get body language over Twitter. Um, you uh, cannot expect a real-time feedback loop. You can sometimes get one, uh, you know, live replies, DMs, something, but it's not like a guaranteed thing. So, you know, that causes people to act differently. If they happen to get into mm. a live sort of situation, they'll be like, oh, it's a live situation. Um, yeah. 
Mm. There was a, a fun experiment a while back um, where we tried out kind of video tweets. You could only respond. I think Tim Blaze did it. Like you can only reply to a video tweet with a video, and it just like had video conversations going down. And we we discovered that Twitter wasn't a bad video platform, but it didn't last, unfortunately. But you've got me thinking about whether there was a way of making a a more umbral version of Twitter, if there was. So kind of how can you convey more of a human? in that format rather than just do it with 280 characters per per message. Mm-hmm. I, I think there is a compression thing happening that you sort of need to know how to decompress sometimes. Um, there are people who seem to be a little more unhinged in a good way on Twitter. Um, and this is, you know, they, they're the type of guy who's a little unhinged maybe and just sort of posting from just uh, – intuition or um you know gut response kind of stuff um that that feels like one version of it and you can usually i i I think i can tell like when someone is doing that or i I like often have this question um and then you know a lot of what malcolm tweets for instance like i've seen him tweeting i know what 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 the background process looks like and it's more like thoughtful a lot of the time uh, I think uh, Tashin does an interesting, like, both. He does, he does some, mm. like, just post, post, and then sometimes, like, thought uh, based on what I've seen. Hmm. Out of interest, which of the modes that you've seen scares you the most if you were to do it? Oh, definitely the gut response one. Actually, they both, they're both scary. <laughs> That's why I don't have very many tweets. <laughs> um Part of the the technic like what what's technical about sorry what's scary about the technical bit uh, being a more here's a here's a thought um, is uh, and I, I've this is one thing I have said before maybe this is my bit I'm like who's who's listening who's reading this like what what are they gonna think um, I, I think Malcolm or Sarah tweeted this thing but um, one one thought I've had recently is you know the pendulum swings both ways anything that I I feel that I would say. Uh, someone else would say an equally valid thing sort of in response and the other way. And I'd be like, well, you're not wrong. And yeah. it, it, there's a certain pointlessness to that um, that I haven't quite resolved. I think if I did resolve that, I'd probably be posting a lot more. Mm. Yeah, I guess it comes down to um, what kind of guy are you almost, um, which is not just the way in which, but the the message or the 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 things that you stay, take a stand for almost um, rather than just say that's a good point too yeah <laughs> we're all making good points <laughs> mm-hmm. interesting I think I have done a fair bit of the like gut posting um, but it, it's only been like a when it's a strong like this needs to be said sort of thing or, or like oh I could tweet that and then I like do but I don't have the thought of oh I could tweet that very often hmm. it's like it's like is this a self-contained idea or thought that's kind of what i think i guess gets tweeted interesting so i want to integrate i guess this this twitter thread with the community thread um that we've touched on earlier partly because i was curious about I'm... the community thing too okay well, let's go there again um and only because well not only but partially because i'm not so good at this I, I don't mm. think I've had the experiences that it sounds like you've had with in-person communities and navigation of communities. So I guess just as some, I don't know, preamble to that, but what do you mean when you say community, just that I can follow you in that thread? Mm-hmm. So one thing I have tweeted is uh, you should join more than one cult. Hmm. Now, th- th- this is, you know, deliberately a little inflammatory, Um uh, I don't, we could probably dissect this as an interesting example of why did I tweet that as opposed to not tweeting it and like, how was I thinking about that? Um, but the, th- the thing behind that is a lot of people have almost been afraid of functional communities or things that, you know, have an identity a bit too much, especially in uh, the rationalist space or people who are, you know, have been skeptics, they've deconverted maybe, uh, people who don't want to be controlled a little bit. Um, and so cult gets 
has has been thrown around as this thing to avoid uh, you know to avoid culty thinking and whatnot but there's a lot of things that i think get thrown out with uh, the bathwater there when it comes to cults um and i also say you should join more than one in that uh, if you can, you know, have multiple perspectives that are sort of strong and present in your life, uh, then you won't like just become slave to one of them and you'll have a, you know, a parallax perspective on whatever it is you're doing. And so that's why more than one cult. Um, my experiences have been like getting really into particular groups and communities and sort of trying on their ideology a lot of the time. And uh, there's something of a unique thing that I seem to be able to do of sandboxing the ideology and being able to participate in it. Um, I, th I think there's something I do where I like cannot participate fully, unfortunately, that I've comes as a cost of part of this. Um, yeah. So... You know, you could say dance is a cult, the West Coast Swing in particular. A particular dance is often cultish, when you, get, especially if you get to higher levels. Uh, you know, rationality is a bit of a cult. That one's definitely been thrown around a bunch. Um, I've also been to Landmark, which is people have accused of being culty. Um, what else? My very first community experience where I was like, oh, community, uh, was when I became conscious is that this is the event that precipitated me becoming conscious uh this was a summer camp in 2009 that was an international summer camp bringing together a bunch of uh youth for uh, training and leadership pretty much and uh from that i was like well this you know being in a community is pretty cool there's a lot of people you know thinking like i do and uh, turns out not all humans are bad like i thought they were Maybe I can, you know, participate with humans in trying to do something good and cool. Huh. Uh, so those are some of my experiences of community. Hmm. I'm curious how you relate to all that. It's fascinating. I've framed like that. I maybe have a couple more than I thought I did. Um, so my, my Alizana technique training felt a bit like that. Um, and I would often kind of say we're not a cult in a kind of, we are not a cult <laughs> kind of voice to remind people that we're acting very culty. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think you're right. Whenever people get together around a shared, we are here to do this and our way is better than other ways. Um, and people don't understand us because we're a bit weird sense. You can kind of get a, I mean, it's not cult in the, in the normal sense of the word. It's not kind of, there's no control element. Um, but there is a sense of exclusion and um, we are different to it um which i which resonates a bit i am curious about one thing which you kind of just slipped in there and then went quickly on which was the time when i became conscious back in 2009 <laughs> <laughs> like what what do you mean you became conscious in 2009 with this this community you were taking part in um i beforehand didn't feel like I was trying to do anything in particular. I, I, I didn't really have agency. I didn't, my, my thoughts didn't necessarily connect too much to each other. Uh, Cause they didn't have to, I was just sort of sitting there being like unimpressed with most people, uh, thinking I would be able to do better. Well, of course, you know, not really doing anything. So uh, there was a dramatic shift in my agency, my ability to try and do anything, you know, like immediately afterwards, I uh, got my first girlfriend. I actually started talking to people at school and I made friends, more friends there. Like I had like five beforehand. Um, I, I like actually interfaced with people as opposed to just sort of uh, people. Uh, hmm. And I started telling people about what I thought instead of just thinking it to myself. That was another big part. That's amazing. I mean, it's, I think people tend to need that moment. There's a kind of 
drifting and then suddenly like oh i'm a conscious agent i have autonomy and i'm sovereign and i can influence the world in interesting ways i'm Mm -hmm. curious like let's assume there are people listen to this um hi listeners (laughs) um and they're they're in a kind of a place where they haven't yet awakened but they have a kind of a sense that they should what would you what would you say to them almost of like how to navigate that path a sense that they should Let me frame that a different way. There are some people, I guess this is part of the experience I had with reading person development books and like doing the whole self-help thing and knowing that there's something that needs to happen, but not really sure what that something is or just kind of searching or seeking. Uh, That might be different than my experience. Like I was not even reading self-help. I was Mm -hmm. vaguely reading politics and... Uh, learning about computers because I don't know, interesting. Um, if you're already reading self-help, you like probably are some, you're farther along than I was at that time. Okay. Uh, it, it sounds to me like you're describing someone who's just in, basically in a rut of some kind, um, who has not yet been in a rut and gotten out of it. Um. And that, that's a more regular experience, I would say. You know, the first rut you get into, how do I rut? I feel like I'm in a rut kind of right now. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that, you know, this podcast is going to be part of getting out of it. Uh, like, I feel like it hasn't quite yet succeeded, but it hasn't not succeeded yet either. Uh, it's like uh, it hasn't been given its chance. So, you know, that's why I'm still doing it. Hmm. Um, mm-hmm about that yeah there's two things come to mind one is a, a kind of meta level thing um but i'm just i'm noticing that you and malcolm have similar mannerisms which um intrigues me <laughs> um and i just i wonder which way that went if that makes sense so which mannerisms, mannerisms i could probably tell you uh so there's one where you um imitate a thought form almost like hmm, i wonder what i think about this kind of thing that that one's uh, definitely a Malcolm shaped one. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah, just interesting. Given that I haven't met either of you, I've just had a few zooms with Malcolm and now this call with you. I guess that touches upon your your Umbra point of how much more you can pick up that isn't communicated mm-hmm. elsewhere, but it still creates a gestalt of a person that yeah is is important. You obviously yeah have picked up enough to be able to see that you know reflected in me as well Mm. the first time meeting me yeah so anyway that was just a a thing that was in my head and i wanted to catch Mm -hmm. um but the other the other thing is i mean i I can't not pick up on this but you said that you're in a rut um right now and this podcast is part of the de ratification process or hope so i'm guess like do you want to talk more about the rut and and what it's like in there sure um I mean, as I said earlier, I'm like trying to get into this Twitter scene. Uh, that's part of uh, another like you know method of getting out of the rut. Like, I, and I said earlier than that that I was, you know, I've been on Facebook and my community's been there, but I've been kind of like mm, Facebook. Um, in, in some sense, everyone's kind of in a rut because of COVID. Uh, some people have you know adapted, or their situation was like, oh, this is just fine. Um, I kind of fell into a rut that then was like COVID compatible in a certain sense. I didn't have to change anything. I could just be in the rut and that would be fine. Um, But I I was already sort of distant from a lot of people beforehand. Um, And partially because I'd just been traveling a lot and my social community has been mostly in person, but in many different locations. And there's not like this common, there's not as much of a common graph or a common... uh, the graph is not connected in such a way where like they know each other as well. Um, the Twitter, Twitter and the rationality are like the closest things, honestly, but there there's, it's lacking a community sense. You see, um, the community has been, you know, I go to the Bay area and people there are in person or I go to dance conventions and then people show up. Um, so it's been in person and 
distributed and I basically have avoided being in Vancouver the last few years. And now that I have to be in Vancouver in some sense, uh, because I can't travel or haven't been able to travel to various places because like there's, there's just been too many things with COVID to prevent mm -hmm. me from doing that. I've been having to face, you know, what is my life like in Vancouver? Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of, um, couple of things there. One is, and we'll come back to the, what is life in Vancouver like, but I just, there's something mm -hmm. interesting in, in what you said around the being, being in many cults you said <laughs> yes. um and it seems like there's something around a difficulty in recent months years in being in more than one cult almost so you've, you've been cut off from some of your cults almost yeah um, that, that is how it feels and particularly the in-person ones because if we link in the the umbral the, the the embodied stuff it's much more difficult to find in person cult communities so to speak so that might be why twitter feels a bit odd because it it is a community but doesn't meet your community criteria of community feeling you touched on earlier right it doesn't i don't feel like i'm part of the conversation yet i don't feel like it's going to produce it, it hasn't been producing as many you know real life meetings like people who are familiar with the twitter street aren't in vancouver mostly there's a few people mm. um, but it's not enough to be like uh, an outpost of in-group Twitter or something, um, the way that mm -hmm. like, you know, New York is, or the Bay area is, or, you know, wh whatever the like big cities are on visas, uh, list of people, for instance, yeah. like, I feel like if I was in New York, for example, I would be meeting up with more people and, you know, people have been doing that. Uh, th there, there's this, like, does it produce real life, uh, results? Mm -hmm in some way that I'm really looking for that I haven't been getting. That's kind of part of the rut thing. Mm. Yeah. So there's a thought comes to mind, you know, finding the others said Timothy Leary um, and, and Twitter is a good way of finding the others. But if they happen to live in Singapore, then that's not necessarily much good to you in day to day life almost. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Out of interest, um, I'm happy to zoom out of this topic if you prefer, um, so we can go elsewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we're just following our curiosity here. Yeah, I, I know, but I, I also I'm lacking a lot of context, um, mm. so I want. I mean, feel I, free I to ask. Know. Well, what is the context then? So I mean, I feel, <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting a felt sense of hmm. I otherwise could ask more questions in this space, but something is telling me not to. And I'm wondering mm. if that makes sense to you. So this is a, this is a great question. This is this is what what is great about this question? Uh, is there, there's, it's an interesting move of like, you know, I'm getting this vague sense. I'm going to follow this vague sense and give uh, give words to it and put it in the middle here. Put it in the space. The, very cool. I think that's why you're on this podcast. The ability to uh, say this kind of thing. Um, I also find it interesting that you know you're asking, well, you know, what what is the context of of what's going on? Um, that's uh, one of my favorite questions. Uh, asking about the context. There's all there's a whole you know in joke meme to myself almost about that question. Um, huh. uh, I don't know exactly what's causing you to uh, think that you shouldn't ask more questions that there might be a bit of, um, I've talked a bit about this before, um, in other places, uh, there's, I, I guess there's a, there's a wanting to have my you know, advice of like join multiple cults and then someone being like, so how's that going for you? And then being like, well, the, it has been great, and right now it's not. And so there's a bit of a hmm going on there. Hmm. 
I think I mostly haven't said much of this on my podcast, though, so. Hmm. Just to check in with the embodiment, there was something you were checking with there. You were kind of going back and forth with your body. Well, how would you verbalize that if you're willing to share? <laughs> hmm. There's a like finding the right sentence stem sort of feeling of going around like this. So like, how do I hold this like feeling or thought going on? And, and there's a, at what pace should I be trying to answer this question uh, as well? Uh, like it's sort of a checking for, does this feel rushed, defensive, uh, something along those lines? Um, does anything feel, what, what feels alive here for me? Um, especially when you're asking, you know, does, there's there's something saying that I shouldn't ask more questions. I'm like, okay, I really got to check because I'm, I'm obviously something uh, in the, you know, the two-person system here that's like giving you this. Um, I'm, I'm participating in that interaction somehow. So like what, what kind of, what, what is my energy? What is, mm. uh, often that is like, okay, so I got to reveal something happening for me. Okay. You know, take on my first person perspective a little bit. Uh, I often feel when you, ask, you, there's a couple of questions you've asked where I've been like, oh no, I'm being like seen or something a little bit, or it's like, I gotta, gotta, be a bit more legible in a certain direction. Uh, that's that's a funny uh, experience that I have where I'm like, and that's what I want to do. Right. Okay. That's what I'm here for. Okay. Hmm. Well, I guess that ties in with the whole first person thing, right? So the attention yeah. is on you, the spotlight's on you. Mm -hmm. um, how would you, if, if we weren't having a, a podcast where the explicit frame is it's about you, um, how would you have otherwise navigated an interaction like that? Uh, what, which part of the interaction? So you mentioned, hmm, I get the sense that Michael wants more legibility from me. How do I navigate that? And because we're in this frame of it's my first person perspective, I should process that and go there. I guess I'm curious what would have happened if we were just having a chat in a park or something uh not not that different i think part of it is that you're asking the question in the first place when you might not otherwise hmm. um there there is like i feel like i am able to you know give my first person perspective it's just never my or it's often not where the conversation goes somehow or it's not uh the, like you know the the reflex a lot of the time it's uh, there is a bit of a, like, you have to pin me down a little bit. And then I'm like, oh, right. Okay. Okay. I get it now. Hmm. Do you, have you felt like it... you've had to pin me down or have I been a cooperative? <laughs> I think you've been very cooperative. Um, I'm just aware of, again, the meta layer of us having, this is our first conversation ever. Mm -hmm. um, apart from three sentences before we started hitting record. Um, so navigating all of these topics on like for the first time while being recorded is there's a lot of la levels of awareness and noticing different um, loops going on and then picking okay which one do I ignore which one do I go on which one do I trust at this moment okay that one hmm was that the right one I'm not sure let's um matter it again and right. reveal all the four loops the four levels <laughs> and then put them out there <laughs> you know mm -hmm. there's so just a lot which going one is this? on uh oh lord <laughs> i'm not sure i know anymore um this is the one where we talk about the podcast experience while we're having a podcast um not the one where hmm eric is talking and i'm wondering if this is the right direction we should be going in that's a different one the different levels of meta almost mm -hmm. that i'm picking up on while having this conversation I mean, out of interest, how aware of you are? How aware of the fact that this is a podcast are you while you're talking? 
Uh, I, I'm used to being recorded in a lot of conversations. Um, that's part of it. Um, I'm used to also dancing in front of people at this point. And there's certainly a mode where, it, like, it mostly just feels like I'm talking to you, mm -hmm. pretty much. Uh, I'm, like, vaguely aware that someone else might listen to this or something. And that, that definitely does, you know, screen off certain directions. Mm. Um, in this, like, the, the, the thing I said earlier uh, about going, oh, um, there's, there's a sort of like, I wouldn't even think of doing this in other certain situations where I'm like curious, but like too bored or something like there's this boredom that's preventing me from doing a, I body language curious thing. Mm. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, there's a certain amount of screening off. I, I probably don't spend as much time in silence as I might otherwise. Mm. Um, but I, I still, spend a decent amount um to you know give breathing space uh, it's some, something like in the background is like you know it's both say say stuff but also don't have to say stuff are these like, yeah. you know, this competing sort of thing going on um but remind, your question was what's how aware am i of this podcast and there was some other i have another one of these thoughts that's over here somewhere that i want to get back to uh, about something about what's, you know, the experience of talking about the podcast on the podcast. Uh, maybe it'll come back to me. Uh, I have another question so I can go oh, down that road. I was like, what's, what's your experience of being on this podcast as opposed to, I don't know, recording videos or mm. uh, other podcasts you might have been on. I'm not actually, I don't actually know. I mean, it's interesting because I feel more, responsibility in this one um because i'm the one i feel like i'm the one kind of navigating the conversation a little bit so kind of hmm, we could go that way hmm, we can go that way kind of job um mm -hmm. which i've been on about 10 podcasts as a guest so i i'm aware of the kind of letting go of that a little bit there's a kind of sequencing of answers kind of nudging in certain directions when you're being interviewed for a kind of it's an interview um frame um, but this is very different because I think if, if it were my podcast, I would have, um, kind of researched you and had a list of, Hmm, you are about these things and I want to dig into these things. And you said over here about this, let's talk more about that. And I didn't want to do that with this. I wanted to kind of <laughs> go into it, have a rough sense from the other podcasts that I watched a bit of like what you're about roughly, um, but not want to dig into any of those things and just see what came up. Mm -hmm. So the layers of getting to know you, navigating our mutual interactions and kind of how do we vibe while also doing all that and also being recorded, it's a really interesting awareness game. And the way that you're kind of doing this of like, oh, that thought forms over there, I have the same things. Like I'm I'm seeing these ideas that I might get caught up in certain um, traps, if you like, um, mm -hmm. in different parts of my spatial awareness. And I've, it's like I said at the very beginning, I've never come across anyone else who has just gone there so easily. Like, it's over here somewhere. Like, this thought's just here. Like, no one else has done this before. I have to kind of, I teach this in my course even. Like, no, ah. what if you imagined that there were thought forms in space and then you could interact with them as if they were in space? And it's, just, it's amazing that you just have that, <laughs> which no one else seems to. Well, that's really interesting to hear. I am special. I get to feel special. I am good. <laughs> um, I do remember my other thing, hmm. which is um, you, you're, you have a certain skill in asking questions uh, at like a high enough speed and interestingness factor that I, I notice that I spend less time on meta something or being like able to bring that in as much somehow. Um, Tashin also did this. He was like, oh, very good question. Very good question. Very good. I was like, oh, I'm just like happy to answer these questions. This is, this is fun. This is, I'm playing, you know, this game. Um, and, you know, if someone is not as pointed with their, their questions or whatnot, um, then I, I do have more space to, uh, say something about meta. And so like, I noticed you're the one bringing in the meta stuff a bit more than, uh, I would expect or something. Um, hmm. And like, I'm noticing that 
the, well, what's that, what that is doing to my experience and attention. It's very cool. Uh, what is it doing to your experience and attention? Well, so basically I, I'm noticing the difference in, in how much attention is on like ask, answering a question versus like trying to navigate stuff versus the navigating and meta and how I'm answering this question. Um, so like right now you just, you know, you asked a question and I was like, right. I didn't like say something about that. I got to say more about that. Okay. Mm -hmm -hmm. Um, and then I'm like, all right, now I'm just answering the question instead of doing the meta thing. But now I'm doing the meta thing uh, on, on purpose now that I'm like more aware of it, of my awareness being squeezed a little bit. But I, if I hadn't done the previous podcast, I wouldn't necessarily notice that as much mm. as well so this is an interesting bit of data of like you know depending on the skill of the interviewer in asking questions and uh not not even just skill like how how pointed is are they about asking questions um and how how much responsibility are they taking upon themselves to ask questions in this interview eric frame yeah i love how meta we got there that's that might be the most meta I've experienced in a long time. <laughs> meta really? commentary on the metaness. Well, I, I have meta in my life, but I get the sense that you are a very a man who likes his meta. Um, yes. You're comfortable with this, <laughs> I sense. And, and uh, you know, the quality of meta. You cannot just stack meta, hmm. I think. Like at some point, the thing you're doing at that point is just stacking meta. You know, hmm. you're not... The, the, there's like a, there's an art to meta. Uh, there's a quality of meta. There's an art. Uh, I'm not not quite sure how about to say more about that now. Than that, that is a thing, and that I don't like mm -hmm. it when people just go, ah, oh, but like, what about the meta, 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 meta level? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay, great job. You're just doing the same thing over and over. Now here I am describing the sort of meta move you are making. That is my kind of meta. Yeah, meta for the sake of meta doesn't tend to get anywhere, mm -hmm. I found. Mm. So taking it down a couple of levels, not quite to object level, but nearer to object level. Um, I'm really, I want to dig in a little bit more to this, this experience that you have that I got excited about by Thought Forms in Space, which sounds like a B movie, um, sci-fi film. <laughs> um, Thought Forms in Space, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so... When you come across one of these, like it's over here type things, like the idea that I might say something is over here, I might say something else is over here or wherever it might be. How do you, how does that situation like unfold? How do you interact with that thought form? Mm. And I can almost phenomenologically as well, not yeah, just yeah, yeah. like rationally. Uh, so I, I notice whenever I'm considering some idea, it's kind of, you know, it's in front of me, it's in my field of view a mm -hmm. little bit and then there's a bunch of things that are outside of my field of view that you know that's why they're over here mm -hmm. uh, but i like proprioceptively can feel that they're over there so they're like there's this like oh, gravity sort of over here and then um one thing that i'll do is you know i'll grab a thought from the background that's tickling me and then i'll bring it back and i'll put it next to mm. the other one and then i'm like hmm how do these what's the what's the relationship between these two can they be combined are they dependent are they what's what's going on um and like these are the only two things in my field of view in some sense my like thought field of view is how mm. it feels but like there, there's there's an analogy to just visual field as well um when i'm dancing there's a lot of not looking at my partner that i do actually and this is mm. Some part of that is like, you know, if my partner's over here uh, and I'm going to go this way, I just need to see that, you know, the space is free. Uh, but there's also a, like, I'm mostly actually just paying attention to the proprioceptive feelings of what's happening. And hmm. that feels similar here. It's like, you know, I, I'm paying attention to the thoughts that might be over here or, you know, down. Down is more like body. Hmm. My body is down other thoughts and stuff are over here. This is other stuff that like I might turn to look at. Um, 
there's I also noticed there's a like part of the this this thing that Malcolm does a little bit. Um there's a similar one of like he does this. Um one one that I've I, I like the head tilt for curiosity and a sort of uh I'm doing the Malcolm version now, though. I, I've had my own version of like I, getting getting a different perspective on this thing. What is it? And like right now, I'm like trying to be close to the microphone to have good audio quality. So I'm like mm-hmm. messing myself up a little bit, actually. I'm noticing the microphone's located here. This is this is how people <laughs> can hear me. <laughs> that, that's there's there's another interesting thing about awareness of like you know when you're talking and like how how people uh, are used to being near a microphone or not how conscious are they mm-hmm. of being next to the microphone i that, that seems relevant somehow although i'm not sure to bring that in mm. well what i guess some, some some experiences i have about that yeah, commentary no, I, from the alexander technique guy go <laughs> i love it i love it so much um the, this okay a few few threads um one is in the dancing where you're almost you're looking where you want to go on the the dance floor, uh, and you're paying attention to proprioceptive feelings, but not to your like looking at your partner almost. Um, I I would frame that as your partner is still in your awareness, in a sense. So your awareness is expanded. You're aware of the entire dance floor, and your own body and your partner are in that same integrated field of awareness. I'm guessing that if you were, you know what it's like probably from what you're saying to cut certain things out of your awareness. So Hmm. for example, what would it be like if you were dancing and you kind of forgot about your partner, for example, what happens when that happens? Mm -hmm. Are you asking that now or? Uh, Yeah, I'm asking. So like uh, maybe you have to go back in time a bit to when you were less like adept at this, but if you were too concentrated on the, the, getting the moves right and not bumping into someone and you kind of forgot there was a human there. Um, Right. I'll just say why I even asked, are you asking that now? Um, because one of my habits is to sort of pose a question, but I'm not like trying to answer the question. I just like, here's, I'm considering this question. How does this uh-huh. relate as like, you know, one of my ideas, like, oh, this curiosity. So I wasn't sure if that's what you might be doing. Um, no, I'm, I'm curious about your, your felt experience, basically. Mm-hmm. It's intriguing to me. Cutting out the awareness of my dance partner is what you were asking about? Yeah, we can make it more general. So I'm, 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 I'm just like, of... that feels super alien. And like, uh-huh. what what I'm more likely to do is cut out the audience. Okay. If so there let's is an go audience. that way. So, what's that? Like, what's that's that like, that's definitely a yours. bit of a tunnel vision onto my partner and the dance floor and the music. And like, super vague awareness that there's an audience it's it's normally when like something is happening in the music that uh, requires some amount of audience or like happen to be facing the audience and then i'm like oh yeah there's an audience right (laughs) um but especially um in competitions where there's more than one couple dancing it's just like ah it's just social dance i uh vaguely aware that other dancers are on the floor and i have to avoid them uh and but there's like not an audience. I totally forget that there's an audience. Hmm. I'm curious how your dancing might change if you like were more aware of the audience and the kind of like not only aware of them, but kind of included them in your awareness in the same way as the other dancers and proprioception and your partner and all of it kind of in one space. If you ever had that experience, it would it would be interesting to see how it changes my social dancing more. Um, I have done one routine that, you know, a big part of routines is being aware of the audience because, you know, you're the only ones on the dance floor and you're very much Mm -hmm. presenting a choreography to the audience. And uh, initially I was terrible at this. I was just like stone faced because I was, I was dancing how I normally would in the sense of like uh, paying attention to where we are in the music, what's going to happen, where my partner is, make sure I can, you know, use my control systems to uh, manage all of that. And, and so I had my stone face on going on. Um, but then, you know, I, I sort of automated enough of that 
and my dance teacher was like, you got to, there's an audience. Did you know that? And I was like, yes. Was like, okay. But you didn't seem to. <laughs> oh, I didn't notice that I didn't seem to. Hmm. Hmm. And my, you know, I, I did work on this and my last two performances, I'm, you know, much more engaged with the audience smiling it's like oh the audience wants to see how i feel about this particular part of the music and then move right um i i sort of then reintegrated that and just sort of was like i'm having fun dancing this thing now and I, it didn't take a lot of effort it was it was very natural to just have fun dancing in the routine hmm. um, and just like letting it show a bit more pretty much Huh. While I ask the next question, I'm going to adjust my camera because I'm getting quite dark over here. This is the time zone issue mm -hmm. and with that lack of good lighting. So now I'm less dark. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, like, what the mental move is to just have fun. Like, if if I were to like come across a dancer who was clearly stuck in their head a little bit, and I said to them, "Just have fun," that no, could right. go one that's, of two ways. That's <laughs> so, not very helpful. So what? So what's the move that you're making in that situation that isn't getting you stuck? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is like, you know, the just be yourself sort of advice, yeah. right? And it's like perfectly useful to someone who can already do it uh, and useless to someone who can't. Um, yeah. So like in my internal language, you know, just have fun is uh, it's more of a description of what's happening rather than like a, a move I'm making. Um, the move I am making there actually is uh, it's it's sort of like letting the audience in on the joke. Hmm. If that makes sense. It's like I'm having fun here. Can, can you see? Can you see that I'm having fun? Um, would you like to be dancing with me? Would you like to be dancing this thing? Isn't this cool? This thing that's going on, I think it's cool. Mm. And th there's also a move of just uh, of of uh, paying attention to how the music actually makes me feel. Um, oh, and there's. If the audience is cheering, that also helps. That's like, oh yeah, the audience exists. Uh, the thing we're doing is in fact cool. I mean, I thought so, but you know, it is it is cool. Well, uh, you like that, huh? Okay. Well, well I'm going to give you more of that. Um, there's there's that element as, as well. Like, can I even hear the crowd cheering? Hmm. Um, I don't think I heard the crowd cheering ever until even even at the very end. I was like, I had you know a whole particular exit and bow that I had to do that I was like, I was just too zoop to really pay attention to the audience at all is, you know, just felt like a big whirlwind. And then I was done. I was like, Oh, I just did. We just did our routine. Oh, geez. I don't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a common experience after doing a routine in particular as well as you sort of don't remember what happened. It was all just, which yeah. is different from I'm social dance pilot. Yeah. Yeah. How is social dancing different out of interest from that? In social dancing uh, or like competition dancing, um, because it's all live, you're you're in a certain way interacting with what is happening in the dance a bit more. Um, and there's, I, I usually will remember like what dance I liked the most uh, out of you know the three or four that I do. Um, I have a sense of, you know, which dances I want to look at that I had, um, who, who I liked dancing with, which song I liked. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sort of less aware of an audience. If it's a, I, I probably transferred some of my choreography routine skills to um, the competitions where it's a spotlight, meaning there's only one couple on the floor. Hmm. Um, a little bit. I I notice myself when I watch myself dancing. I I seem a little, a little awkward about it. But it's like overall a bit more smooth than I would have expected. I'm a bit more. I don't know where I get this charisma from, but it just happens. 
sometimes it's really it's really strange like oh that guy's he's, he's doing and but sometimes i'm also like seeing like the little little awkward pauses and something and that because mm. you know it's very easy to be overly critical in certain ways as well awesome I'm, I'm really enjoying this because there's um there's a mental move like associated with getting out of your head in a sense that people either can access or they can't i found um once they're shown in some sense oh it's this it's easy to access but others just can have can never get it so it's the um yeah it's like, it's like are you doing the analogy. get out of your head move yes uh, oh exactly. okay get out of your head okay or i'm gonna try hard at getting out of my head uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's get out of the car Which yeah get out of the car push? that's <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly so yeah i'm just i'm always on the lookout for other ways of describing that that thing of mm. no it's not any of the buttons on the dashboard no it's not try harder to be in the moment there's something else that's like orthogonal to it in some sense. Um, and you're describing it as having fun, as being aware of the audience, um, various things like this, which to me sound like trying less hard, giving giving the object level less attention. The object level of dancing is less important in your awareness almost. I don't know if that's resonant for you, though. Uh Hmm. I guess the the way I would say it in a more general sense is just paying attention to what's happening mm -hmm. um, and not like shooting at what's happening right. or something. It's just like, well, what is happening? You know, that they're, oh, the audience. I can hear the audience, you know. Um, I, I, I've, I've described this experience of when you're also doing a routine, you're like a you're sort of watching yourself dance mm -hmm. a little bit um, because, you know, you've, you're on autopilot enough. Uh, you can, the, the dance, it just happens. You just like, you sort of know how it should go. This, and this also is different in social dancing and I'm not quite watching myself dance as much. I'm watching sort of how my partner's dancing more so. Um, and in, in dancing in particular, you know, with someone else, um, part of how I get out of my head is I get into the other person's head. Maybe is one way to say it. Uh, mm. that, that also has, you know, pitfalls of like, oh, no, they think that I'm a bad dancer or that move sucked or whatever. And really, they're like right. just trying to do their own thing. Uh, and like maybe they're making, you know, a bit of a resting bitch face a little bit. Uh, and it happens. Hmm. Something interesting for you describing around that links back to our conversation of multiple matters, mm -hmm. ultimately. Um, so when you're dancing, you could be entirely object level of like, where do my feet go? And then there's different levels of what are they thinking about me? What's the audience doing? Is What's the music doing? And am I aware of all these things at once? And there's something from the sounds of it about the way you want to be on the dance floor is by integrating all of those things at once. So kind of letting all the, all the control systems do their own mm -hmm. thing and you just get out of the way almost. That's how I'm interpreting what you're saying. Yeah, and this this links back to the deliberate performance bit of I'm all, I'm sort of paying attention to one of those levels at some time in particular, um, and mostly letting many of them uh, do their thing so that I can you know see what they're going to do without my conscious intervention as much. I, I, this is very much related to, and this will be a, a topic of uh, on on uh, Tashin's podcast. Actually, I'm going to be a guest. Again, there, cool. exactly how did I, you know, get better at uh, dancing the way I did? So I will probably go into that there. Um, but this is this is a good, yeah. like, warm up of like, oh, yeah, what am I paying attention to? Because it's very relevant to that whole thing. Hmm. I have one more thing to say cool. about that. Yeah, please, please. Um, it, it was, you know, I got tagged, it went somewhere, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Uh, what, what was the question again? Um, I'm not sure now. It's a while ago. Uh, if we want, we can kind of carry on. It'll, it'll still oh, yeah, be there. It it'll reappear. Different levels. There it is. Different levels of the dance. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Integrating all of them is an interesting way to to frame it. 
that uh, I hadn't quite thought of before. So that's that's you know that's going in the notebook. Cool. That, that that's kind. Of, I, I think I had some other thing, but it was like it's not a particular completely formed thing yet. Hmm. There's something I want to pick up on as well around going on Tashin's podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of linking back to the being in more than one cult thing is like I know that my experience when I joined this part of Twitter, so to speak, is that I had I must have had more than a hundred Zoom calls with various people um over the last year and a half while doing it um and it's i guess it doesn't surprise me that there's kind of a back and forth of like you come on my podcast i'll go on yours kind of thing um that will elevate someone through the the scene almost or Mm -hmm. get someone more visible so i just wanted to kind of nod to that cool effect of putting stuff out there means that you're more visible almost which often seems a bit counterintuitive to many people i think counterintuitive how perhaps not counterintuitive but just doesn't occur um to some people if not counterintuitive so the the table stakes almost of being part of this particular community is that you make things almost or is that you you say things or you put things out there that others can riff on or you know play with almost and that's what this podcast is Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's just i i quite like i like the amount of work you're going to almost like this is a a non-trivial way of entering the scene if you like Mm -hmm. like here are a series of two hour long podcasts of people who talk to me (laughs) um is is kind of at the more sophisticated end of (laughs) the spectrum of things that people could do um i don't have a point necessarily just kind of wanted to nod at that strategy um and it's cool to see it's like working with the reciprocal podcasting almost Mm -hmm. there there is something there about awareness and how do i pay attention to things uh and one move that's not available to me uh on the internet as much as i would like is sort of just being present Mm. Uh, but not able not having to say anything in particular um like that, that that doesn't come across on the internet that's just you read it and then yeah. someone is like, ah, oh, a red counter went up one. Great. What, what does that mean? Yeah. Right. Um, so this is, I guess, the closest thing I can find to just being present on Twitter uh, or online much is to have this whole shebang put out. And and like the part of the reason I was able, I'm able to do it is just that I have a lot of the you know technical background stuff. I'm familiar with many of the parts. It's all automated in a certain sense and it's Mm. just the who even gets on the podcast in the first place was the thing i was having trouble with and then uh, how do i frame having that conversation and then malcolm's like what if this and then i was like yes you do it i I hate trying to figure (laughs) out who to talk to and everything you just and he's like great that's what i want to do and we're like great that that works really well What's that like, actually? Because obviously, I I came to you via Malcolm. Mm-hmm. So, what's it like having Malcolm act as your agent, where he just sends you people who he thinks you'll get along with on a this kind of two hour long, hour and a half long podcast format? Uh, I, it feels like he's doing the hardest, most difficult part for me, easily for free. It's uh, you know because it's two parts. It's like you know who just selecting who at all and then also doing the the introduction and the mm. uh you guys should talk sort of thing and like you know framing it in enough of a way where uh there's enough buy-in such that they want to do it you know before they ever talk to me in particular <laughs> yeah yeah um, and it's, 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 I'm, it's, like, it's... I'm relying on malcolm's you know social cred here hmm no, it's I'm just it's the first time I've seen this model being done, not just in terms of the podcast format where the the guest interviews the host or the the reverse um frame, but also kind of outsourcing some of the yeah, the discoverability and the other stuff as well. Um, Most people are like very self produced in that sense. Very self produced, yeah. So people would normally <laughs> The podcasts that I've been on, they tend to kind of, they already have some audience. They'll do the reaching out. They'll, it's all, it's all about 
um, their process, which is fine. I mean, that's kind of how I would do it as well, I think, um, if I were to. But the kind of community element that you've brought into it. So flipping the frame here, getting a friend of yours to who you trust to filter people um, and do the discoverability stuff, it feels much more collaborative and much more kind of as part of an existing web as opposed to trying to make yourself known in a particular web, which is kind of the other angle, I think, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I, so I, I don't know if I've said this before on my podcast, but I really hate selling myself as well. Um, and that's part of that's part of the whole first person perspective bit. Um, I, I basically found that selling myself is unreliable in a certain way. So if someone else can sell me uh, and they're inclined to do so, great. Um, I, I think that's just like more effective um, in in a certain way and like more interesting. Um, and uh, I haven't heard a reflection like that before about you know quite what I'm doing and how that's cool. So that's also very valuable to get. Cool. No, I'm I'm happy to to reflect that. It's it's been an experience for me as well. Kind of like being being asked by someone. Okay, so the full context, right? So I've, I've had like four calls with Malcolm and a bunch of Slack and Twitter messages. But then to him to say, "Hey, do you want to interview this person you haven't met um, <laughs> for however long and just see what happens?" I'm like okay like the fact that i said okay is also a kind of a testament to the all the it's not the community but the the social graph stuff mm -hmm. that you see going on right the fact that this is even possible um that we don't know each other until now and now we do um came from me trusting markham and you trusting markham and just like this cascade of trust and yes i think you have all of our best interests at heart kind of perspective i'm really happy to see that um and i'm really I've, I've enjoyed taking part in the experiment to have experienced that for myself at the same time so i just want to kind of reflect that as mm -hmm. well do you have uh, an idea of who else might want to come on this podcast hmm. speaking of the whole social graph doing its thing <laughs> i almost certainly would if i reflected on it um I think what I would like to have happen is just kind of to let this sink in a bit, um, mm -hmm. become somewhat embodied and then have the answer come up rather than cool. um, trying to think about who it might be because the answer is in the body somewhere, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but there'll be someone definitely or a couple of someones. Um, <laughs> I'm aware of the time. I'm mm -hmm. surprised we've gone this long so easily. But I wanted to just ask you before we start to close are there any topics or threads that have come up in this conversation that you wish we'd gone into a bit more for whatever reason that I kind of either didn't know about or glossed over or whatever? Um, there's still something tickling me in the back of my head about community and what that is mm. for you. Like I, I, you have asked most of the questions. Uh, that is sort of your role, but uh, uh, I, I didn't ask as much about like your communities or cults or whatever that you've you've been part of. Um, that's the main thing that comes up for me. Hmm. Okay, so some reflections there. I've struggled a lot more, I think. I don't know a bit more, but I've struggled with community in my life um, in that I've always struggled to fit in easily, and that really only changed mid-20s onwards. Um, before that, I was not good at fitting in. Um, so I don't think I had the... The opportunity to be part of the cult, as you you put it, I wasn't good at finding and navigating them or getting into them. Um, so part of the last few years, in particular, of kind of doing what you're doing now with Twitter, has been in some way quite validating in the sense that, oh, hey, I can just be myself or a particular version of myself, which has emerged kind of unbidden, um, and I've discovered myself by doing this Twitter thing. Like, oh, I can just be that, and people like it, and there's a kind of a high school vibe, but one that I actually like. <laughs> if I had been popular at high school, then <laughs> that's kind of, I, I assume what this would be like almost. Um, so I guess I'm exploring community and things adjacent to it via Twitter. So talking to you happened for me via Twitter, and I'm learning about what community is from someone who's had other experiences of it. I feel like mm. I'm learning almost from first principles via the community what a community is. Um, which very I get cool. it's very matter again. Yeah, yeah, that's the way to do it. 
and yeah, just seeing things unfold a little bit. Um, so it might be a, a case of my my worldview with Alexander technique, but I'm less and less forced with things. So whatever emerges, I can direct it. I can kind of intend to go in certain directions, but I'm very available to other paths as they show up. Um, which is why I was, you know, when Markham said, do this, I'm like, yeah, sure. That's uh, and it, like a side quest, but one that can become the main the main thing almost. And I'm just I'm quite available to those. And that's how I discover communities these days, I think. Um, yeah. Does that apply to dating? <sighs> I think so. Um, I mean, for context, I've... I've had a series of monogamous long-term relationships. So I mean, I've had very little dating experience, um, mm -hmm. but they've always come via. So the internet, band camp, online dating and work. Um, so the whole idea of meeting someone in a bar and then like, that's it then. I don't understand that. There's always like some kind of pre-existing, like we can get to know each other or some some kind of frame where... Although come to think of it, there was no introductory thing. There was no friend of friends thing. So in this context, mm. let's say that we're friend dating. Markham set us up. Right, This is our mm -hmm. first friend date, blind date, ultimately. I've never had that with uh, a relationship. Um, but I can really see, now that I know more about the how communities work and having experienced it from Twitter, how that would definitely work, I think, the kind of arranged marriage discourse. Um, I can now believe a lot more than I would have once believed to seeing how a, a person who knows both people can get make the right call, if you like. That might also be somewhat more particular to the kind of thing Malcolm and I are doing. Like, as you said earlier, you, no one else, uh, you haven't had quite an introduction like this uh, mm. before. Mostly people are self-produced or self, to, you know, they go, on, they go on a date with someone else of their own volition somehow. Um, but, but yeah, the thing I would like to see more is more, community introduction stuff like that um, it's a thing that i think i would be doing in a community if i was in one and knew people well mm. enough. okay no, that's i like that as well since we're discussing the what can people do for each other is how do i frame this question how can i be i mean it's an awful vc question but like what <laughs> would you like from me how can i help you in your your journey to find community let's say on the in digital spaces that i'm a part of um i think tashin's a great role model in this uh space a little bit he's he's been uh, adding me a fair bit on on twitter um he's you know invited me onto his podcast um it's there's something like the initial push or initial like this is a person sort of thing that mm. I, I feel like i need currently in this space um it's something you know malcolm's doing as well uh mm. that's the uh seems like it's probably easier for other people than for me thing to do um uh like you know if something seems relevant you know tag me or right, if something seems relevant mm. to me or like something we yes. said on the podcast or whatever references this thing or like I would have a thing to say about whatever, you know stuff like stuff like that mm -hmm. okay I'm surprised well, I, I actually I haven't answered that question actually that's that's strange you're surprised that you hadn't answered to that question yeah I'm surprised I had an answer it seemed like the sort of question where I'm like I, I hate this question I don't know what to say and then uh, I like okay. had something to say I'm like oh interesting so I got out of my own way yeah. there that seemed like quite a, a well articulated and clear answer honestly it didn't seem like you were struggling to find anything to say at all um i'm happy to do that um part of the thing that i enjoy on twitter is connecting people and much like you're describing what markham's doing kind of oh hey this conversation like this person is relevant here and there's a there's a sense of not just community building but of of raising the the water level for everyone so the more that we can elevate each other the 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 better our experience of the the environment is i think mm -hmm. um so it's in everyone's interest to elevate everyone who we think is elevate worth elevating almost 
mm-hmm. um, which sounds horribly kind of selective and in groupy. I mean, this cult in group for God's sake. It's, it's a little culty. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's, it's a little, little culty. Sus. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, it's it's <laughs> uh, so many traps. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a fun landscape I found, um, and yeah, it's one that I would think would benefit from your participation in more so happy to see that happen i will join this cult do you join the cult but oh, not just this culture and other cults as well <laughs> right well we'll see if i can find any other ones yeah as well uh, is there anything you know i can do uh in a similar lens and there doesn't have to be but i don't think so i would the one thing that comes to mind is that i'm just i'm fascinated by your phenomenological interest in awarenessy things to be very vague about it um i, so, I think i get it so yeah exactly yeah that thing it was so exactly I'm as just, vague as it needed to be <laughs> <laughs> so yeah whatever whatever might come up in that direction um where i was like hey i thought about this in a particular way michael might be interested i'm i'm always on the lookout for um just ways of explaining this stuff ultimately and ways mm-hmm. of showing people as a there there ultimately um and yeah the whole like social graph thing i you know people who think like hey this person's interesting then yeah do that thing as well be great i have felt like i found a phenomenological ally of some kind (laughs) like an ally in phenomenology um that i've i've had trouble expressing or like people haven't quite had the questions to ask to like cause me to actually express what i how i actually you know experience things um Hmm. so this has been this is an excellent selection by malcolm cool i've enjoyed it as well thank you malcolm because i know he'll be watching to the end um Mm -hmm. we appreciate you malcolm (laughs) um and i guess i'll i'll step into the host role and say eric it's been great having you on your podcast Mm -hmm. um thank you for having me um on to participate in it it's been a lot of fun thank you for hosting